The trend of police militarization is something that um, people really talk about starting to happen in the 1960s. I think there were some trends prior to that, uh, but it didn't really take off like it did until you hit uh, really uh, Vietnam and then war on drugs. Uh, and that actually is one of the things that we talk about in looking at and linking up uh, foreign policy to domestic uh, domestic consequences. SWAT teams are probably one of the best examples. Mm -hmm. uh, SWAT teams are now something that pretty much any moderately sized uh, police department has. So if you have a town of 50,000 or more people, mm -hmm. chances are you have got a, a SWAT team. So special weapons and tactics teams, uh, also referred to as police paramilitary units or PPUs. Mm -hmm. So the fact you've got the word military in there, I think is fairly, uh, <laughs> yeah. fairly pointed. But where did those come from? We actually know exactly where they came from. Uh, you have two people who are generally considered responsible for SWAT teams, uh, Daryl Gates and John Nelson. So John Nelson is a, was a former Marine, a Vietnam veteran. He was part of the elite force recon unit. So this unit was tasked with going deep behind enemy lines. Uh, and despite having the name reconnaissance in the title, they were actually a very effective killing force. <laughs> uh, they engaged the enemy, I think it was something 90% of the time, which was incredibly high. Um, and he came back, uh, joined the LAPD, and you have the Watts riots. <laughs> and looking at these uh, race riots, uh, he goes to his boss, so Inspector Daryl Gates, who's a World War II veteran, uh, and says, hey, I have an idea of how we might be able to better control crowds. And he suggests modeling a unit after these recon units uh, that he'd been a part of in Vietnam. Hmm. And so Gates likes this idea, runs with it, uh, and what was originally supposed to be called the Special Weapons and Attack Team, but it was thought attack was <laughs> politically attack impalatable, uh, SWAT Team was born. Uh, it's modeled after uh, that particular unit. Uh, according to the LAPD history, every member of the original SWAT unit had prior military training. Mm -hmm. uh, they were interested in, and if you read uh, Gates' biography, uh, he talks about uh, watching what was happening in Vietnam, getting training from the military. Uh, and so you start to see these kinds of very intimate connections mm -hmm. uh, that are happening between police and the military. Uh, and they're interested in using not only those mentalities that they've cultivated abroad, mm -hmm. but they're also interested in using those technologies that yeah. they've developed. How do we, well, if, if you had your druthers, would these things just not exist at all? Like policing would just be purely the way it was before all this? So policing historically in the United States um, has been distinct from the military. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the Constitution, if you look at laws that came after that, probably the big one that people point to uh, was enacted right after the Civil War called the Posse Comitatus Act. Uh, and I don't even know that one. So What's that one? Posse Comitatus literally translates to Sounds good. a force of the people. And so the purpose of this law was to separate uh, police from the military. So military could not be used as a civilian police force. Uh, pretty much as soon as the ink is dry, this thing is getting violated. Uh, <laughs> it's getting suspended in, I think, uh, World War I, World War II. Uh, then there are a series of court cases in the 1970s that uh, pretty much take any kind of sticking power that this thing had to begin with completely out of it. Mm -hmm. um, and so you see this big blurring of these lines. Um, in addition to things like SWAT teams, which comes within this time period, uh, the war on drugs and the war on terror are particularly important because you see that continued interconnectivity between domestic law enforcement agencies and what the federal government is doing. So now you have police departments who, instead of having their job, which has historically been to be peacekeepers, right. uphold domestic law protecting the rights of citizens, both individuals who are the perpetrators of crime and the victims of crime. Mm -hmm. Instead of serving that function, they are now on, quote unquote, the front lines of two perpetual wars, the war on drugs and the war on terror, yeah. which are different from other conflicts that we've seen before. Because if you think about Vietnam or one of the world wars, the enemy is very clearly defined and external to the United States. Mm -hmm. but 
with the war on drugs, you not only have things like South American cartels, but you have people who are domestically manufacturing, selling, and consuming drugs who are enemies of this war. Yeah. There's been a big emphasis on homegrown terrorism. And so now your police departments are tasked with another job that is not part of their job description. Mm -hmm. And so it's been a building and a combination of all of these things that I think has really contributed to, uh, to this police militarization, which now I think a lot of people um, are more aware of.